I was wrong. <laughs> Donuts, both metaphorically and literally. Hit a dopamine. I love my books. Modernism as a reaction to the bourgeoisie. Oh my god. My name is Caitlin and I read a lot. This month I have finished reading three books and started another two. So without further ado, let's get into this month's reading wrap up. My non-fiction choice for January was Atomic Habits by James Clear. I thought I knew everything I needed to know about habits from reading The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg in 2016. I was wrong. <laughs> this book focuses less on how habits work because I think James Clear knew that anyone reading this kind of already had an idea of what habits were and how they were formed. Uh, it focuses more on learning how to hack the habits you already have, which is a very powerful tool I've discovered. Just this. Just a little bit. There we go. I'm a film student. There is a handy little table in here for all of the uh, he calls them laws of habit change. Here they are. So on, you have all the laws for um, creating new habits and there's an equal opposite law for each point on how to break habits. If you want a recap of the actual book, there are plenty of productivity YouTuber videos on uh, covering all of the laws in this book. But there are two principles, uh, two keys uh, that uh, in particular stuck with me and I thought I would share them. The first key for me is realizing that the desire for something is often a lot stronger than the actual satisfaction you get from having said something. For example, the desire to eat a donut when you pass the donut stand in the shopping center is a lot stronger than the actual satisfaction you get from eating the donut. Knowing that has actually been very empowering for me uh, to be able to say no to donuts, both metaphorically and literally. The second key is about leveraging rewards and punishments. When the habit that you're trying to build is simply just resisting something like resisting smoking or eating junk food, there's no real immediate tangible reward for that, for doing that habit. So it is it's harder to get stuck in the brain as something that you want to do. That's why habit trackers have become such a popular thing. Your brain can register a reward when you tick that box and get a little hit of dopamine. But for me, it's been implementing punishments or rather penalties that have been the most effective. I don't know what that says about me, but hey, <laughs> what works works. For example, I'm trying to maintain the habit of writing morning pages every day. I have decided that on mornings that I don't write, I have to donate a book, which actually gets harder and harder because I love my books and I fully intend to read all of the books that I have. And that's part of the point. A punishment is supposed to be a bit painful in order to motivate you to avoid having to do said punishment. And it's been super effective so far. The next book on my read, oh, you can see my books. <laughs> The next book on my reading list for January was Return of the King by Donald Ronald Robert Tolkien. <laughs> but I am currently only halfway through it right now. I'm actually I'm about to start book six. And by I, I mean we, because I am reading it with my partner. Or rather, he is reading and I am listening. There is cuddling involved in this process. I'm not going to share my thoughts just yet, as I am only halfway through it, but I am enjoying it, and I am also looking forward to watching the movie after I finish it. Now, I had a little extra time on my hands, so I picked up a random book from the library simply because I saw the cover and thought, ooh, pretty! And you know what? I don't regret it. It had some interesting information about the history of aesthetics, maximalism, minimalism, modernism as a reaction to the bourgeoisie, and so on and so forth. I embraced minimalism in my early 20s, and I found it incredibly helpful for helping me to identify what my values were and, uh, and the focus to cultivate those areas of my life. But clearly, aesthetically speaking, I do not vibe with blank walls. So learning about maximalism has helped me to identify the fact that I like to live in the tension point where minimalism and maximalism meet. So learning about maximalism has helped me to see that I like living in the tension point between max maximalism and minimalism as philosophies. 
That being said, the book itself was a jumble of information. The formatting was all over the place. And even though the author is an, a famous interior designer, he spent so much of the book just shitting on minimalism. And I did not appreciate that. And he kept cracking jokes that really neutralized his authoritative writing voice. It just didn't work. It came across very... How do you do, fellow kids? And for that reason, I gave it two stars. The next book, however, definitely made up for that two-star disappointment, and that is The Dictionary of Lost Words. The only reason I picked up this book was because it was a free Audible download one month, and then I found a used copy, so I was like, why not? And I'm so glad I did, because oh my god! This is largely a, a historical fiction. Most of the secondary characters are based on real people that were involved with the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary. The main character who is fictional is named Esme and we meet her as a little girl um, who hides under her father's desk as he's working on the, the dictionary, like um, picking the words and picking the definitions. And they have a really strong bond because he's a single father and they really bond over words. She begins to collect uh, the little slips that have words on them that kind of fall onto the ground. And as she begins to grow older, she begins to see that the dictionary is essentially being made purely by men with the maybe the assistance of some women on the side, but they're not really given credit for it. But the main choices of what's included and excluded are made by men. So she begins to document and define words that are used by the working class people and especially women. Words that were not considered to be important enough to be included in the dictionary. This book is also taking place at the turn of the century, which means that the suffragette movement is kind of happening in the background. And Esme kind of has to grapple with her feelings about that and how involved she wants to be in the political movement and whether she has to be an extremist in order to be a good feminist ally. Not in that language, of course, that's very recent language. The book grapples with the intersection of class and sex at the same time. This book discusses the intersection of class and, and sex and aside from the really wonderful themes, it's also just a really lovely read. It gave me Anne of Green Gables vibes, which I haven't read the books, but I have watched the TV movie starring Megan Fellows and it's just a really, it's a nostalgic watch for me. And this is, that's the kind of feeling I got uh, watching Esme grow up and become a woman in this. For me, it's a five star book. I only give five stars to books that I want to push into the hands of other people. So just here, take it, read it, love it, and let me know what you think. I have already begun reading February's nonfiction choice, which is The Clever Guts Diet. I'm only a few chapters in, but it's already shifted my perspective on a few things and it, it is very enlightening, so I'm looking forward to sharing what I take away from this book with you. And my fiction choice of February is going to be Loveless, uh, because Valentine's Day. It's by Alice Oseman, the uh, author of the Heartstopper series that got, the da 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 da, that got adapted for Netflix last year. So these are the books that's coming in February. And these, plus the one in the corner there, are the ones that I read in January. Plus whatever else, who knows, you never know what's coming. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next time. Happy reading.